can sh share the uh, recording with you after the session, just in case you need something. So, uh, I am Gail from Think Skills, and uh, today is the second webinar of the Training Done Right series. Uh, it's Training Done Right is a seven-week program for trainers, training organization, and people uh, involved in uh, learning and development in any shape or form, and it is to try to inspire everybody to work more collaboratively and use uh, social media, new ID, new technology to make more impact on the learners. And I am delighted to have uh, Michelle uh, paris today with us. Um, she is, um, I think she's fabulous. Uh, I've been following the uh, at No Plaster um, a series or campaign last year, and I think it's a, it's really inspiring and make people bubbling with the idea. And I love the way that really Michelle help people uh, think creatively. So thank you very much, uh, Michelle, for joining in today and uh, delivering this session on using social uh, social learning in the workplace. And uh, it is uh, it is an interactive session, so at any moment you can use the chat, you can uh, raise your hand, ask questions, and um, contribute. And we will use some of the different tools from the session, from the WebEx toolbox uh, over the course of the session. So thank you very much, uh, everybody, for joining in, and welcome, Michelle. So hello everybody, um, hopefully you can see me there. I'm not going to leave my webcam on because I find it a little bit distracting, but I think sometimes it's nice to start with uh, seeing who's talking to you. So this is me, um, I too have a bit of a red nose, but I'm coming out of a cold, so uh, I hopefully don't sound quite so croaky today as I did when I did a live uh, class. The other day, well, it's really great to uh, see everyone here. Thank you, Gail, for having me. Just going to flick that webcam off now and we're going to make a start. Um, with thinking about social learning in the workplace. So this, uh, it, as Dale said, is part of a series called Training Done Right. And today we're going to focus on social learning. Um, so who am I to even have this conversation with you? Um, you'll note there that the big word is together. Uh, I work very collaboratively with a lot of people in order to make sure that we move um, learning and development away from only offering classroom training to embracing all that social and digital learning can offer us. So I'm not replacing, I'm adding to, um, and the mention there of hashtag no plastic is very much around how to do that. And that's the space that I focus in. With my company, Kairos Modern Learning, we help organisations to to really practically look at how they can add to their face-to-face -face offering with um, things like social and digital. So no plasters, we'll talk a little bit, but a bit more later. Um, but that was a Twitter campaign that I ran in 2015 with a little tip every day to support people in that how to do things. Because it's all well and good, isn't it? Going to conferences and attending webinars, reading articles in great publications like Training Journal. Um, but how do we actually put into practice those new things that the, these different uh, sources are telling us we need to be doing. So social learning is just one of those sources, and that's what we're going to focus on today. And I guess we need to start by finding out what our interpretation or our range of interpretation is in the room. So in that chat window, if I could just ask you all to go down there and just tell me, what do you understand by the term social learning? I'm going to give you a moment to do that in the chat window. Okay, Joe's kicking us off straight away with together, as you said, in person, virtual, asynchronous and synchronous. So it is, it's about people with people, that's absolutely my interpretation. Mike suggested it's learning from peers, so people on the same level, we've got Lorna there talking to us about social networks and Twitter. Lorna, let's hold that thought and come back to that later on. Andrea's agreeing with Mike, we've got peers there, and uh, Adrienne there sharing and collaborating on a range of platforms. I'm going to hold that thought as well and come back to that later on. Keith's suggesting using social media platforms. Well, Keith, I think 
we'll have to agree to disagree, I'm afraid, which is not a bad place to be because social learning is not necessarily always agreeing with everyone. It's about having a good discussion. And I'll explain as we go through the session, but social learning for me is not what we're seeing on the screen. What we're seeing on the screen looks like a really interactive live face-to-face -face classroom, which is a great way to learn from people, but it's not just this. Simply put, for me, Social learning is people learning from people. It's as simple as that, and we've been doing it for millennia. It's the earliest way that we learn. So we can see from our cave painting here, the earliest days of how we learnt to, I don't know, pass, pass fire around the globe, or a flint axe. somebody invented the wheel, and suddenly everyone learns how to use the wheel. Now, of course, back in the day of this cave painting, Things like that took, a, you know, a literally a million years, a millennia to pass around the globe. But now it takes barely a million seconds. You know, that's a million seconds, 27 hours. And that really is as long as it takes the new stuff to get out really across all of the different time zones. So social learning is simply something we've been doing forever. Face to face is part of that. Um, the tools that we use are part of that. And that's why I had to disagree earlier with some of you suggesting that social media is the answer for social learning. It really isn't. We mustn't confuse social learning and social media learning. So the, 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 the misunderstanding is very understandable because, of course, it comes from the assumption that social media is a source of learning, which, of course, it is. But social media is actually just one tool. It's a, it's a way of connecting people with people. It's a way of doing things quicker than passing the invention of the wheel literally from one person to another. We can pass one person to many with the flip tweet or an Instagram picture. So we mustn't assume around the tools, um, but social media tool is just that vehicle from, from which people can learn from each other. I guess it's like saying the car is doing the driving. The car isn't doing the driving, the person is doing the driving. But of course, that's changing. Whether it's human driven or machine driven, the car is still a tool, but of course, the driver is actually changing. So we do social learning differently as a result of our tool, social media. We can pass things around the globe in seconds, but in, you know, in and of itself, Social learning is simply people learning from people. Do we agree or do we disagree? Let's have a little show of green ticks. If you're in agreement with my definition or if you're in disagreement, then feel free to put a red cross and we can have a little discussion about that. At the moment, I'm seeing a row of green ticks. Okay, so some people feeling a little bit shy about not putting their red cross up there, and that's absolutely fine, because when we use these new tools, if you're not used to them, it can feel a little bit strange. And it is really important to have a practice in safe environments. So I'm hoping you all feel today is a bit of a safe environment. Jo's put down there in the chat, social, she loves how social media can connect us, but also chatting in the pub is social learning too. I think, Jo, you've hit the nail on the head. It really is just about people learning from people, wherever those people may be. So my question to you now is really around if we've established the differentiation of the tool from the action, if we can see it's clear that social learning in the workplace has always happened, whether that workplace was a cave or a factory in industrial Victorian England, or whether a workplace of today, we can therefore assume that this is going to continue to happen. So whatever we do in learning and development, whatever tools we have in place, social learning is going to happen. The trick really is around how we in modern learning and development, how we harness the social learning and make it part of our programme. So my question to you as it is here, why harness social? Why would we do that? I'm going to give you a moment and while I catch up on the chat for you to just answer that question in the chat. Why harness social? Yeah. 
the answers of I started to come in, in um, Pelle is saying, because we get more ideas when we share and connect. From Joe, because it's what humans do all the time, organizations forget this. From Lona, it's going to happen anyway, best to make the most of it. From Stella, increases creative thinking. Oh, uh, Michelle, Michelle uh, sorry, Mike, um, let me just uh, unmute Mike. Mike, do you want to expand as uh, Michelle suggested? On my point about people want, liking to work with each other? Or? Yes. I mean, I think, I think we as humans, we, we enjoy interaction as part of the reason we work. And I think, um, I think we, if you think about how working works, we talk about all sorts of things. And I think in terms of learning, we like sharing, we like sharing what worked, what didn't work. We like sharing thoughts around, around, around things. And I, I think probably it, it, what that also does as well is it just also, I think, takes some function away from a centralised function. And I think we, you know, we learn better, we learn, not necessarily learn better from each other, but we learn differently from each other and we have an ownership and empowerment over that as well, I think. Thanks very much, Mike. I really like your point there about ownership. It's really important, I think, in modern learning that actually previously learning has been something that has been done unto us as employees, when actually ownership of your own learning, for me, makes absolute sense. You own your own career. You own everything within your learning scope, so, you know, your job function. So why wouldn't you own learning? You know, Stella makes a good point here as well about the discrimination and discussion of the nuances of ideas and information. So for those that use a tool such as Twitter, you only have 140 characters. It can be the start of a conversation that then goes in a live face-to-face -face environment in order for us to have that, or it might go off to a blog to explore thoughts. I mean, essentially what we're talking about here, and thank you for all your comments in the chat reiterating this, we're talking about the glue, the harnessing of the social, it's the social oil, like the people happens when you put people together and when you put people together we want to make sure that the, the, the discussion that the workplace discussion is right you know when someone asks their neighbor how do I book leave or how many customers should I be calling in a day or where do I fill in this on our system an organization firstly needs to ensure that there's a neighbor for that person to ask, you know, maybe they're a remote worker, or maybe as we have budget cuts, staff are being cut. Who are these neighbors that people are going to ask? And secondly, as well as the organization ensuring that there are people in the organization to ask, learning and development needs to ensure that the neighbor who answers the question has got the right information. It's not the shortcut that they've always done because they've worked in the organization for 20 years, but it's actually the process which is the right process. Now, maybe the process is wrong and the neighbor's got the right way, but actually it's about having an open and honest discussion about that. And that's the value of social learning. If L&D harness that, we make sure that we get the right answer, the first fix, the right fix every single time. Now, for our customers, clearly that's going to always be beneficial. For our staff, that's also going to, to mean that they don't interrupt the workflow. So for me, harnessing social is absolutely paramount to, to a good working environment. It's paramount to good L&D. Some of you may have previously heard me speak about injection education. Injection education really is where we get that kind of traditional, if you like, L&D department. So the L&D department that's come out of decades and decades of SAGE on the stage. And SAGE on the stage, don't forget, only started because we industrialized back in the 1800s and we had limited resource. We had to get a lot of people educated to work in factories with very few books, very few teachers. And so SAGE on the stage is a way of having somebody up front talking to a huge bunch of people. Well, now we've already explored a little bit we have different tools, we have the different opportunity. So we don't need that injection of education when we can ask our neighbor and the guaranteed answer is the right answer. 
does anyone agree or do we have some disagree? What's going on in the chat for me? Um, can, I, can I ask you, Gail, to keep me abreast of what's happening? Are people agreeing with what I'm talking about? Or I think something? so. They are expanding on collaboration and uh, learning, which is uh, kind of going along the lines of what, uh, what, um, what we, you, you were saying, I, I understand. Um, so it is quite uh, quite busy. It's actually quite um, quite high pace on both sides. Quite a lot of information to to, to process. Absolutely, um, I'm really liking Stella's comment there about the challenge around sage on the stage being earlier and medieval times. Stella, I think academically you're absolutely right. The idea of the education system did start with universities. I guess for my purposes, I was thinking about workplace learning. Workplace learning started in that format, copying that medieval a university type environment um, when, when we had the Industrial Revolution. And that's morphed into what we have to get trainers taking the lead. And that's absolutely right. It's the right thing to do for some of the time. My challenge around injection education is injections wear off. If you give a big pile of knowledge transfer, even if you give it in the most brain friendly way, the challenge you then have is what do people do three or four or six or 12 months after the course when the trainer isn't there? Where do they go then? And that really is a gap that social learning can plug. It means that people have something at point of need it means that when they turn to their neighbour and ask a question, L and D are actually, as a function, nowhere to be seen. But the information shared is only as good as the neighbour's knowledge, unless L and D provide some tool or some way or some checklist for there to be something other than injection education. So I guess that this is why I formed No Plasters. It gets to the root cause and it deals with that injection education. Somebody asked me on Twitter, injection education, Michelle, is that painful? I suggested to them it is not painful if we do it together. We don't need any plasters if we're offering more than just injections of education. So that's where No Plasters was born. And we started to look on Twitter every day at different opportunities. Now, let's take a look at those opportunities today. Just one quick interruption, sorry, Michelle. Yeah, so we've absolutely. got a, few, a question here from Joe saying, when my attendees email me sometimes after the course, a uh, course, cool, sorry, that is that social learning? I believe so, Joe, absolutely, because you're continuing the conversation beyond the classroom and they're asking you and you're going back to them. And so, you know, it's people learning from people. If the basic premise of social learning is people learning from people in whatever form that takes, be that email, be that as we are now on webinar, or be that through a written letter, um, you know, it's still people learning from people. So it's really, it's almost like I paid you, Joe. It's a good segue into our next session because we're going to have a little go here using some of the tools of WebEx. And we're going to actually have a discussion with a whiteboard around what tools we have available to us um, in order for social learning to take place. So I'm going to hand you over to Gail, who will explain how this little section will work. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, sorry, I was having a quick look at the chat. It's, once again, it's very busy. Um, Mike says classroom is widely diminishing, but we should remember to be aware that we can build on this outside of it. And I think that I think that's what uh, your point, Michelle, wasn't it? Is that it's mm -hmm. not about eliminating the classroom; it's that offering learning options outside of it and after and before. Yeah, it's adding to, and to pick up on Stella's point there about some of the challenges of people learning from people is misinformation. For me, that's where L&D can plug in. That's where L&D can actually make sure that the misinformation isn't misinformation. It's your best experts and the availability to your best experts. It's, you know, well, I don't want to answer my own question here. I'd like you guys to have a think about that. So we might come back to that in a moment, Stella. So. Gail. Excellent. So, um, quick exercise here. So, if you all want to uh, take ownership of one of the uh, lines there, it is how we are going to use this flip chart. So, we're all going to write at the same time on it. So, on the top, 
uh, left-hand corner, you've got a blue arrow. If you click on the arrow and click on one of the lane, um, then that's going to be the lane where you are going to write. So I am going to move my pointer so you can have um, one of the lane free. Then once you've taken ownership of one of the lane, please can you type your answer next to it. So next to the blue arrow, you've got a T for text, and then you click on the T and click next to your arrow, and then you can start typing typing away, but we will only see uh, what you've typed one, once you have typed, uh, clicked again on the T. So the question was, what tools can we use to harness social learning? And uh, let me just uh, maybe ask Mike show to move his uh, arrow forward because we cannot see the tip of it, can only see a little bit. And same thing for Stella Kalin. Stella, you might want to come in uh, towards the slides. Click on the slide because um, we can't really see. Um, and if you're a little bit unfamiliar uh, with WebEx, I will repeat how to do it, so if you know already how it works. So click on the key on the top left-hand corner next to the uh, arrow. Everybody has used the arrow. Well done. And when you've clicked on the T, click on the slide just next to your arrow and feel free to type away. And we will only see your text once you go back to the T and uh, click again on it. So at the moment, you're all typing, but we can't see anything except for Joe, who's been super quick as usual. <laughs> we know, Joe, Joe, we Joe know. you are very used to the text. You are <laughs> a queen of the online world, so thank you. <laughs> So thank you, Stella, started to disclose what she's typed. So uh, Stella, well done. Um, so far, I can Mike, only see... Sorry. Mike, you go to the chat there. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling with the tool. So for those of you who didn't quite get it, it's click on the T, do your typing, and then click on the T again to make the typing appear. Excellent. We've got a few thank ideas you. coming up there. Give you a moment. Waiting for Keith and Adrian. Okay, they're great ideas. I'm going to think more widely. I'm loving this. Stella's seen lots of things people use and she's never heard of. We've got Lorna there with web conferencing software, online classroom, traditional classroom. Thank you, Lorna. So absolutely. Let's not forget this is adding to, not taking away. So Joe's added loads of good ones in there now with flip charts, job shadowing, uh, one that's just skipped off the bottom of my page, what we've got there, supporting each other. Absolutely. I was really keen in this exercise to remind you that it isn't just enterprise social networks, it isn't just Yammer, it isn't just your intranet, it isn't just SharePoint or your learning record store, whether that's Tesla or Moodle, Curator, Loop, Noddlepod, Fuse, there's lots of really great platforms out there, but it is also checklists, it is also posters. It is also lunch and learn. It is also going for a walk with your manager. These are all tools and techniques, I guess. I did mislead you a little bit, um, you know, for having great conversations. And great conversations really is at the heart of people learning from people, of that social learning. So thank you so much for joining in with that. Um, you know, when I think about what Stella was saying earlier about the misinformation, of course, as Lorna's put there, she loves a, a walking meeting. So do I. But how do you know that the information in that meeting is accurate? I think, for me, where social learning uses techni techno can't say it, technology tools well is where there's always a place to go to get the right information. So when we consider, for example, that the default setting has always been your neighbour, the default setting in any company as you're waiting for your onboarding course or as you're waiting for your 
you know, introduction to management course, yet you're doing your new management role, your default setting is the people around you, asking your neighbour, asking people in the team meeting. And they're all fine, they're all great, but what the, the actual technology tools allow us to do is they allow us to have the best neighbour, the best neighbour available at the point of need, the best neighbour with the best answer. So a tool, for example, such as a platform like Fuse or like Tesla or even like Loop where you can ask a question, you can therefore get a great answer. L&D can monitor those answers and so those answers are accurate and within the scope of the organisation. It can also throw up processes wrong. It can also throw up that there are better ways to do things. So you end up with this collaborative piece where instead of, for example, HR dictating policy, policy can be born from within the organisation. Instead of operations dictating the way the factory line runs, the people working the line can support the changes that are required to be more efficient. And for me, that's really how social learning comes into its own. So my advice then when we're thinking about tools is find out where your best neighbours are. Find out in your organisation where people go already, because people will already know who's the best on Excel when they're stuck, who's the best on the bit on the uh, the generic system that you use when they're stuck. Who do they go to? Who knows all about how to fill in the holiday form? Go where they are, and they may well be on the tools you just mentioned. They may well be on WhatsApp. They may have their own Facebook group that you know nothing about just because you're in L&D and you're not on the front line. It could be that your managers already meet on a Friday and go to the pub at lunchtime. Great social learning tends to take place outside of the boardroom and not within the organisation. Now, the challenge, of course, is if you're a face-to-face -face trainer or an external supplier or a freelancer, you don't necessarily have an organisation. You don't have a best neighbour. So this is where your best neighbour is actually your personal learning network. The people that you meet, the people that you network with, be that on a tool like Twitter, which is my go-to tool, which I love, I find that there's always people in that space that can give me fantastic answers. Um, it could be in face-to-face -face meetups, such as um, L&D Cowork, which I run with Fiona McBride. Those types of spaces give us the opportunity to find our best neighbour. So where in your organisations do you think you might find them? Where do you think that the social learning conversations are actually taking place? Just a quick one in the chat. Where do we find our best neighbours? And it is actually what Stella was asking uh, in the chat. She said, is there a challenge that uh, the best neighbours may be very hard to get hold of or maybe even reluctant to share information for whatever reason? Stella, you make a good point. The best neighbours may want to hold that information. And in, in traditional hierarchical companies, when the only option is to move upwards with the knowledge you have, and that's your personal differentiator, holding knowledge actually becomes your, your currency. However, in more modern organisations, more enlightened organisations, actually sharing can become the currency. Those that share the best will actually have the most visibility within an organisation and they, are, they then become more likely to get the promotion. So we're switching, we're in a state of flux right now where where our best neighbours have gone from holding information and not sharing it to actually getting value from sharing it. Um, so hopefully that answers your challenge there. Um, I'll give you a nod out to your Brain Friendly Learning Group. It is a great group for best neighbours, um, particularly for those in, in organisations and external to organisations as well. I like the fact that Mike there put managers forums so teams encouraged to share and generate support. Now, that can feel strange if that's not the way that your organisations work. But if, for example, somebody goes away on a face-to-face -face training course, a prerequisite for that course and their, their spend on them going could be that when they come back, they have to be a best neighbour. They have to share with everybody else in their team, in their departments, 
of what they've learned on that course. That will do two things. It will help that learning get out to other people and then be, then be a best neighbour. It will also help them to embed that learning that they've had because teaching somebody else, as, as I'm sure we all know, helps us to learn ourselves and helps us to embed that learning. So, you know, that's a great way that managers forum that Mike mentioned. Now, a managers forum could, for example, happen online when we think about IT. Most of the IT departments and most of the corporates will get their learning from external IT forums. That's where they'll go for their Ruby on Rails developer questions when they can't do something. That's where they'll go for their SharePoint challenges. They won't have people internal to their organisation necessarily who can help them. It's a very normal thing for IT. I always find it interesting when IT become the blocker to social learning, learning forums within organisations. Um, often they're doing it themselves, but it's do as the, not do as I say, do as I tell you sort of thing. So just to pick on some of the other things in the chat there, um, you know, Joe's agreeing with both Stella and myself in two chats there. Um, <laughs> Stella's being agreed with about it might not be social media, and I agree. Social media is a tool. Social learning can happen in all types of guises, so it is about thinking widely. So, um, as I mentioned is here, maybe a CIPD group or maybe outside of that group, you know, um, Joe's mentioned scouting. I'm a girl guide leader. My girls teach me every single week and they're doing it in unintentionally. It is a, a really great place to learn. Um, we've got mentions of, of scientist groups, we've got mentions of IT, hasn't been on a training course in over four years, only learning socially. Um, we've got mentions there about um, on-demand support. Once a relationship's in place, it can carry on via online functions. Mike and I met online, we've met face-to-face, -face, and here we are online again. So it really is about having a go and dipping your toe into this space and really giving, I think being part of a best neighbour, it's not just about taking, it is about giving as well. Now the challenge with best neighbour, the challenge with um, going where people are, the challenge with harnessing your, your, um, your subject matter experts in your company could be this, it could be culture. A little nod here to me formerly living in Japan and struggling with a very different culture. It taught me well that experience of two years living in Japan of how not everyone shares our view. Now I appreciate today many of you online earn your living in a face-to-face -face space. So this could be culturally very different for you to think about doing social learning beyond the classroom. Remember, always adding to, not taking away. We can see already from our discussion in the chat, from our whiteboard earlier, and from um, you know me talking with you here, there are lots of tools already in place. There are lots of spaces for social learning is happening, even if that's in the smoke hut or the canteen, really great places. Um, you know, we've identified that it is happening, and it is happening anyway, whether learning and development and whether our trainers harness it, it's going on. What we're talking about doing is setting up our learning programs in order to harness it with the right answers, with the point of need solution, with the go-to place. It could just be a checklist, for example. If your company culture is not ready for a technology intervention, just having a checklist of who they can go to when they have a problem with the bespoke system, when they have a problem with how to book that holiday, when they have a problem with access to the building if they're working late. All of these questions that interrupt the workflow, all of these questions that would be a best neighbour question, even a checklist of your best neighbours and their phone numbers or their email addresses, and of course their agreement to support each other is a really good step in moving your culture to modern learning environment. Does anybody uh, Michelle, I think yes? it's actually tied nicely with the comment that uh, Stella made about scientists who are, maybe maybe it's a culture issue, or maybe they are not just such good neighbors, she's a bit undecided, um, but they're actually not uh, really, I think, open to actually exchanging ideas and collaborative, mm -hmm. um, collaborative learning. How is that, um, how do you think that, is that more culture issue and attitude issues? How, how do you think that can be tackled? I think for me it's two things in addition to culture, uh, one of which is permission. 
have they been given permission to share? And by permission, I actually really do mean sort of from the top. Is that a normal way of being for the CEO, for the senior leadership team? Are they open sharing people? Um, because that will permeate through whether you're a scientist, an engineer, a teacher, hospital worker. Um, that, that sort of the, the permission to share is very implicit within a culture. The other thing is environment. Many people work solo. They'll work alone or very small teams and they'll get on with their day jobs. Um, you know, for example, scientists investigating cures for cancer or whatever it might be, they're very focused and driven to their day job. And consequently, the environment they're in isn't a sharing environment. It may be that they, don't, they want to share or they just don't think of it. Um, but actually setting up in learning and development uh, across network, across departmental, across company conversation, it could be a monthly webinar conversation, it could be um, a problem explore hour, uh, it could be a lunch and learn. Just getting people from different departments in a space together, you may find that the, the sharing starts to come. Um, it could well be that you have a subset where the very nature of the organisation means that sharing could potentially give you risk to external. And again, that's a culture. Where does your culture sit within risk? Are you happy for people to share internally? Now, my issue around not sharing is if those people leave, they're leaving with their knowledge. You're not managing the knowledge within your organisation. And if you hire people, good people, why wouldn't you want them to share within your organisation? Why would you leave that to happen outside of their, you know, the organisation or when they leave the company? I'm often surprised, I do quite a lot in the voluntary sector, how much people give as volunteers, yet how much they don't give within their own organisations that they're paid to. It's almost like they go to work to fund their lifestyle out of work. And for me, that makes me a little bit sad because there's so much more people could be doing within their organisations to make their organisations productive and successful and to make themselves feel fulfilled, but their organisation culture doesn't allow for that to happen. So is there anything else, Gail, in the chat that's, that's being picked up on that I should um, Mike, pick up Mike on? Mike said that he's, um, he's saying that you make a very important point to the need to have relationship in place. Uh, people work better with each other if the relation, there is a relationship in place. So, yeah, um, that, that comes down to trust, Mike. And many organisations don't necessarily have an open trust culture. Um, so, yeah, relationships are massively important. And for me, part of that goes back to what we talked about earlier with injected education. You know, if, for example, you are allowing a broader sense of learning, people are having a chat over coffee, people are having brainstorming meetings or collaborative meetings across departments, they are watching a video on, of the, the, the subject matter expert from your internal organisation talking about their expertise, the CEO walks past. You know, the senior leadership team walks past, what happens next? Do they tell everyone to get back to work or do they pat that person on the back and say, good job, good job, you're actually sharing, you're collaborating, you're sharing your knowledge. Um, you know, that for me is the fundamental part of the permission and the environment and the culture piece. And that's where relationships are really built. Because of course, if we always carry on doing what we've always done, we're always going to get what we've always got. Now, I'm mindful of time and I'm keen that you go away with some ways to actually do this stuff rather than me just talking about it. So the next two slides might be where you want to grab your pen and paper. Of course, this is being recorded so you can come back to it. And for those people joining in beyond the live session, welcome and, and please do keep in touch beyond that. But these are um, an interesting list of how we can really, having established that learning is taking place outside of the classroom, having determined that there are tools that can harness it, having thought about our cultural fit and things that might need to change within our organisation, you know, you are perhaps ready to embrace social learning in the workplace, but it's part of a bigger picture. It's not just about social learning. So here are some tips to help. Um, do one thing at a time. Tiny changes demonstrate value, and those values can be talked about, can be collaborated on, and we can actually use that as evidence, gathering evidence to move our story forward. Knowing the problem, knowing the issues that people have with 
the process, knowing the issue people have with the line of the factory that they're working on, knowing the issue people have of not having good relationships with each other can be a space where L&D comes to work. Learning to listen and listen well, and then of course learning to ask good questions are all part of the whole story around that as well. We go on to think about distinguishing sense from nonsense. I absolutely love the tip. For me, this really is about knowing and knowing your organisation and where you are on your journey. Social learning for you perhaps might be a checklist and for others it might be a video based learning platform. You need to understand what makes sense for your organisation. Number six there, accepting change is inevitable. Change is happening all of the time. When we call it change, people tend not to like it. They get a little bit anxious around it, but actually it is happening. It only takes you to compare your history of where you've come from to where you are today to remind people how change is inevitable. It is happening, it has happened, and it's not a scary thing. Number seven is where many organizations might have a challenge admitting mistakes. And I think in learning and development, we are also in this camp. If we stick with what we've always done, we will continue to do something that now is a mistake. It is a mistake to forget that social learning happens every day with people who you're training because they're doing it in their private lives. By, by not embracing it, it is a bit of a mistake. Of course, 20, 30, 40 years ago, when resources were not as they are today, training face-to-face -face was the answer, and that's fine. But not admitting that there's more to it today, I believe, is a bit of a mistake for learning and development. Number eight there is about say it simple. If you can't say it simply, then you need to hone down your story. If you haven't got, for example, any evidence to suggest that this is the case, that you need to move away from just offering injection education and you can't articulate it, work on that articulation before you share socially. Number nine and 10, I think are just, just good things for life. Be calm and smile. Now I'd really be keen to know what tips do you have? What can you share? Um, I'll slid on too quickly there. What do you, you know, want to share in the chat? I could hear it going mad in my ear. So, Gail, what am I missing? What are people talking uh, about? It, it is going um, absolutely hectic about um, actually um, what is recognised learning. How do you engage with um, with the concept of, uh, of, uh, of, of learning? Do you have to be an expert to actually uh, be able to share knowledge? Um, and what are the, the, the barrier to sharing? So there were like a whole conversation mm -hmm. about okay. um, uh, money being wasted on learning tools and, uh, and, and the conversation, what is a good learning conversation uh, compared to, you know, face-to-face -face courses? Okay, um, so much, so much there to pick up on. Barriers to learning, and Lorna notes about there being confidence. And I think confidence comes in social learning from trying it out. So it may well be that many people get confidence in their private space before they actually will take that into the workspace. And that's absolutely fine if that's the journey that you need to be on. Um, barriers tend to be, put, uh, to be in place or put up by not getting to the root of the issue, by not actually understanding what is the sense, what is the, the business purpose. If you go straight back to business purpose, the barriers tend to fall away. So to give you an example of that, um, you know, having a conversation with a manager about what learning does your team need, uh, sorry, need, you will tend to get an answer that is about learning. If you have a conversation with your managers about what struggles are you facing at the moment in your teams, what's not working, you will then get an answer that's based in business need. And it could be, you know, a couple of my guys aren't getting on very well, or it could be that we're just overworked and we've got too much to do, um, and our process isn't helping that. So then you know the learning is around relationship building, and um, it could well be you guys, you know, let's go for a walk and thrash this out, let's go and get a coffee together, let's build a relationship. It could be, you know, we've got too much on, the process isn't working, let's strip back to process mapping, let's have a collaborative um, learning session and look at the process. Now they're very different learning interventions than let's go on a course. 
and that's where social learning really is as fluid as it needs to be. So, as I say, barriers tend to be put up as a result of asking the wrong questions. Um, it, of course, isn't always as simple as that, but I hope that that's something you can take away and try. Um, other things that are coming through in the chat there really are preempting my next slide, which is really about what more do you need? What more do you need in, in your personal journey, in your organisational journey, in order to move um, social learning into your learning programme agenda? I noticed Keith has asked a question there. Let me just pick on that. Being an obvious dinosaur used to structuring and developing a path through my learning, I have a concern that being able to just dip in and out key building blocks, logic steps might get missed. How do I make sure areas are fully covered and structures get very loose? So Keith, let's take that issue of relationship building within organisations. Traditionally, people may have gone on a having a difficult conversation course, or they may have gone on a, um, a team building exercise in order to, to make that thing work. How could we do it differently? What does that structure look like? I think it's really just about having a more honest conversation with the individuals concerned and allowing those to ask this question, what more do you need personally? Now, things may get missed, as you say, so then it's about learning and development blending through this formal and informal. So having key, key points and key directions, but not thinking about them only as uh, a team building exercise, or only as an, an externally provided um, course on having difficult conversations. Um, rather, it is, yeah, we can go on the course if that's what we need. We've identified business need to do that. But beyond that, how will you contextualize? So you may have a TED talk about relationships that you want to share with people. You may add um, a string of pearls of wisdom from other teams that get on really well. You may put um, the, the, the conversation back away from learning and into HR, and it may be what more is going on for those individuals that's beyond the workplace. So I guess what I'm suggesting is a more holistic approach to all aspects rather than just having learning as our core focus. Keith, does that support you in, in thinking differently? Does that support answering your question? Do you want to give me a bit of a, a, a yes or no in the chat there? Just checking. And just to build on that, uh, Michelle, uh, Joe was coming back to say that if we miss a learning step and block, uh, I, uh, sorry, if I miss a stepping step, I need to seek that out. So I guess it's also about uh, having time to uh, reflect, maybe that's what you meant, to, and uh, take the time to actually realise where the blocks are missing. Yeah, yeah, I think it definitely is. And I just think it's, um, it's largely around the individuals being responsible for that as well. When we've traditionally had that sort of stage on the stage mentality where learning is something that is done unto us, then we can look to that. And of course, if we work in a hierarchical structure, looking upwards for being told, you know, what do I think? What do I say to customers? How do I act? What is the company culture? That's very typical. So learning is just part of that structure. So for me, this is a bigger, a bigger piece than just learning, um, but it is one step towards that bigger piece, if that makes sense. Keep to come back with, I'm currently wrestling with all those issues, so great food for thought. Well, let's keep in touch, Keith. You know, I'm regularly on Twitter if you want to stay, play in that space, and my Twitter handle's on every slide, or if that's not your preferred option, then please do keep in touch by email, and we can talk about these things further on. So, I want to ask you all individually what Twitter says, Keith. Twitter's a tool. It's only a tool, but it's a tool for social learning. And people say to me, oh, Twitter, there's too much noise. I say to them, you're following the wrong people. Okay. Um, <laughs> we don't need to know about the celebrity gossip, but we can connect with really great learning peeps, or as we prefer, tweets. Um, <laughs> I, I very much encourage That's you. That's a new one for me, tweets. <laughs> tweet. I want to ask you this question. Genuinely, I want everyone on the, um, on the call today here on this webinar to um, put in the chat what more do you need in order to wrap your learning and development arms around social learning. Let's help each other. Let's use the network we have in the room here today to support each other. Perhaps as a bit of a fun thing to encourage us all to move over to that Twitter space. And, you know, maybe we can do that in 140 characters. What more do you need, people?
Okay, Joe's suggesting she needs to balance work and personal learning to take advantage of all this. Keith is talking about practice support groups for newbies. And uh, Stella's saying more evidence. I love that, Stella. I love Keith's uh, very practical approach. And, uh, you know, I love Joe's balance there. I love the evidence. There is a lot of evidence recently being published. And in fact, last week, Towards Maturity published their latest annual report, um, their benchmark report. If, if you're not aware of Towards Maturity, do Google them, go to their site and download the report. Stella's app right to gather um, evidence to prove that this is the journey that the organizations need to be taking uh, and towards maturity is a great place there's also good practice another great resource for good um, uh, reports that can give us the evidence but gather your own evidence it, it doesn't take long in an organization to actually have conversations with those on the front line and ask them where do you go when you're stuck don't ask them where they go for learning because that's not their language. But if they're stuck in the workflow, where do they go? And go and spend time with that space because you'll find bundles of evidence. Um, you know. But that, as Mike said earlier, is about building relationships. If you're seen as an outsider to the operations team, you won't necessarily get a truthful answer. So it may well be you need to strip back and start with that relationship building. Thanks, Joe, for sharing those fantastic reports and resources for the evidence. Um, other things we've got there from Mike with regards to what more do people need. We've got trial ideas and watch them. Yet, yeah, I'm loving that kind of the working out loud type approach. Suck it and see, find your own evidence that way. And uh, we've got uh, Adrienne there, time to go and give it a go. Yeah, absolutely. Find some time for that and start small. Don't don't feel that this is a huge mountain. Feel this is a tiny hill, a little mole hill, in fact, and just try one thing at a time and to dip your toe in the water. Lorna's suggesting she needs time to reflect on ideas and try out the tools. Lorna, I think that's a really important piece of advice for all of the people on this uh, session today. Time to reflect. And it's certainly something I've come to, in fact, overnight. And uh, I, I tend to blog when I'm in a reflective space. It helps me think and sort out my um, my approach to things. So that's what I'll be doing later on today um, to do that piece of reflection. That's a great piece of advice for everyone. So I hope now you can see when asking what more and asking people you know, in this, this space, in other spaces, you get so many good answers and they help inform and, uh, your own thinking. So I encourage you to do that, uh, you know, to, to go where you need to go when you're stuck. And Stella's saying she likes that comment. Absolutely, it's a great question. If we talk to people in organizations about learning, it's no good, it doesn't work, it really doesn't. Um, you know, so they, they, it's just not their language. Lorna's also noted about good practice of a weekly podcast. I love their podcast, it is a really great conversation. It always makes me think and Joe's put out there about learning now TV obviously um, I'd love to promote that because I'm on it <laughs> so thanks for the shout out there Joe but uh, more than me a lot more important people um, you know have really great learning conversations in that space there's also learning now radio who do podcasts so you can see if you want to Keith I invite you to dip your toe into this new world there's lots of opportunities to do that and start where you need to start know yourself know your organization, know the journey that you're on. Okay, so uh, I'm keen that we finish on time today um, and I'm keen that we have the opportunity to continue the sharing and, uh, and to continue thinking about social learning. So I definitely invite you um, to have a conversation about training done right, so to go on Twitter and to use that hashtag and to continue our thinking um, as we go through the rest of this programme. Gail, perhaps you might like to invite us to have a little think about other things that you're doing in this training done right space so that we can all learn together. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. It was a fantastic presentation and I think we all thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, watching the chat. It was hectically busy. Uh, and um, and I think it was a really good reminder that uh, learning is at work in the workplace is not about uh, for, not always about formal learning and less and less about formal learning. It's about collaboration. It's about creating learning environments and learning cultures. It's about bu building trust and building confidence. 
and learning in conversation. So it was, I think, a thoroughly enjoyable um, session. And thank you, Joe, for all your links. I will send them uh, to um, to to all of you when I send the, the recording, or well, those that I managed to catch anyway. So thanks a lot, everybody, for all your contribution. And I think that what uh, collaborative learning is about, isn't it? It's about sharing. And um, as Michel said, if you have any final answers, do you want to raise, uh, click on the raise a hand uh, button to maybe ask them verbally, or if you want to um, type them in the chat and uh, and um, and share some ideas, some more ideas with us. And as uh, Michel suggested, what is uh, training done right? Well, training done right is leverage multiple uh, media to actually encourage the, uh, the the training community. So people who are the uh, uh, um, not necessarily in the workplace to try to work better with uh, HR and uh, corporate L and D. To, um, to use and leverage those social media, those informal learning, and work a bit more digitally with, uh, with their, their clients and partner. So that's what uh, Training Done Right is about. So if you are on the training side, please join in. And if you are on, not on the training side, but on the L&D side or the human resource side, please join in as well to actually share your view and share what you want and what you expect. So we will be delighted to have your input. Thank you very much, everybody, and a very big thank you to uh, Michelle for all your time today. It was really a great session, and it's much appreciated. Well, just to say I thank you to everybody. Michelle for no, you haven't. I thought I thought I'd turned my microphone off, but I hadn't. Jo will tell you when I work with her. I often I stop talking to myself and not to everybody. Um, I just wanted to quickly just uh, invite any final questions, any final concerns, or is everyone everyone got so much to think about their their brains are about to explode? I'm I'm sure so, it is the case. I'm feeling like that. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, for your little clap there. I'm glad that you're finding uh, WebEx tools. Um, it is, it's not my most familiar platform, and uh, I have to say I've been quite down on WebEx, but it's, it's improved in the last five years since I've used it. Um, well done, WebEx. But uh, it, is, it is important to attend webinars to have a practice on how to use these things. So uh, it's, it's a great way of learning by just being here. But uh, no one's got any other questions. Okay then, Gail, I think we're good to leave it for today, okay? Absolutely we are. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time, and you may disconnect now. Thank you, and bye-bye.